Greetings everybody around the world. It's time once again for Ancient Aliens Radio. This is the dedicated radio show for the cast of Ancient Aliens. Here we interview authors and researchers as an ongoing investigation into the ancient alien theory. Don't forget to like us on Facebook or subscribe to the YouTube channel Ancient Aliens Radio. And what a show I have today. I shall be talking to Nancy Redstar about her work documenting the star ancestors and Native Americans. There are three works in the trilogy, and as I mentioned in her biography just now, um, and having read her book, um, Star Ancestors, Extraterrestrial Contact in the Native American Tradition, I immediately ordered the other two. Um, and so I'm looking forward to them coming. And I really enjoyed the book. I really, really did. Um, and uh, the other two books are Legends of Star Ancestors, Stories of Extraterrestrial Contact from Wisdom keepers of the world and star ancestors indium wisdom keepers share the teachings of the extraterrestrials and this is really unique subject matter um you can look nancy up on nancyredstar.com or you can follow the links on the capricornradio.com homepage. so let's not waste any more time and let's bring on nancy hi nancy welcome well good morning james how are you and it's good afternoon for me but yes it's a good morning for you too oh that's right that's right yeah <laughs> Uh, so where are you based at, Nancy, exactly? I live in northern New Mexico on the southern Colorado border at the base of the Rio Grande. Um, well, I guess you could say not the, exactly the base, but actually it is. there is a base here. Um, but the Rio Grande is down quite a few hundred feet, you know. And um, it's one of the oldest spots in the United States, mm-hmm. one of the oldest pueblos here, Taos Pueblo. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so it's a it's always been a beautiful place. It sounds hot as well, not like little old Ireland here. We're we're in a, we're on the brink of an ice age up here at the moment. Really? Yeah, no, it it can get hot here, but we're 7,500 feet above sea level. So, it'd be pretty cold at night time too. It can get cold in the winter, but we're 90% sun, so we have a lot of alternative architecture here. We one of the first off the grid communities started here, actually the biggest one in the country. Right, awesome. The earth ships where you can grow bananas in January. Beautiful. In your house. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, Nancy, so I first came across you on the Ancient Alien series, as I read out in the biography, and I finally bit the bullet and got one of your books, and I'm really glad I did. Um, I have some people on the Ancient Aliens I'm not too sure about, and some I am, and some I like, and some I don't, and some of the information I like, and some I don't, but you've got a presence about you when you're talking uh, Nancy, and I, I think it's obviously to do with the subject matter too, um, and you have a very important message to tell, um, which is why you're here today. Um, and just for the listeners in Ireland here and the UK, um, oh, we do have a big fan base in America as well. Just perhaps tell us about your Native American heritage or your background and, and, and where you come from. Well, my mother is a Parker a red man parker van which are some really predom- predominant uh Cherokee families um she is cousins third cousin to Bonnie Parker and a lot of people don't realize that the bank robbers Bonnie and Clyde Bonnie Parker was Cherokee and most of the reason why they did that was be- they did that round of- they've been totally mis misrepresented in Hollywood because the reason that they went on that banking spree was in in uh, protest of the Federal Reserve Act and um, when they confiscated all the gold. So in the movie Bonnie and Clyde, you don't really get the picture. You know, it's distorted uh, of what happened and why they took on the banks. Um, I always say when I post a vid- picture of her or video, um, they robbed the banks before the banks robbed you. So also the Van family is well known, um, Chief Crazy Horse, uh, Crazy, Crazy, Chief Crazy James Van is a relative, um, and he also was fairly insane, um, meaning the name, you know, he um, was kicked out of the Cherokee Nation. So a lot of my relatives were not welcome in the Cherokee Nation because of their behavior and protesting and they were they were rebels pretty much um that's on my mom's side my mother is uh, is also uh the granddaughter of um William Burroughs 
William Burroughs, the first American naturalist writer. So she's English and Cherokee. So I think I've read about him. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. John Burroughs. Excuse me. John Burroughs. It was one of the first naturalist writers in America. Sure. Yeah, and that's that. She she was the daughter. Um, her mother was the daughter of his first marriage, and he didn't acknowledge that marriage or the children really he didn't remarry someone else and had other kids so that's the story on that one and um i grew up not in north carolina although my my mother's family was all born in north carolina Mm -hmm. um i she had moved up to new york uh to pursue a modeling career actually and Mm -hmm. met my father and and married there and and we i grew up in connecticut so yeah that was also an incentive for me going out to to start to gather that information on a subject that I found very interesting and also very disconcerting the way the news the propaganda is around this subject um, is orchestrated for an agenda an ultimate agenda uh, like Werner von Braun said you know um, the UFO alien threat is the last trump card they're going to pull and I really believe that's true and I I really wanted to get another side of this subject because you know when I went on the UFO circuit and did conferences and lectures and you know, 90% of the, those events were geared in a commercial way towards this alien abduction theme which is done really by exotic weaponry. So Nancy, just for the listeners, let's explain. You've gone and documented some stories of the Native American tradition, and there's various um, tribes, I guess. There's the Anasazi, the Hopi, um, to name a couple. Um, so you, you've gone there. You, I think you say in the book you're not an elder but a runner. Is that in the sense that you, you've collected the information to bring this story to the forefront for humanity, for to tell the, the non-knowers out there about this? About the ancient relationship to cosmological deities and, and beings and how they influence the ceremonies and the rituals and the taboo nature of, of even speaking about it because, you know, I, this book I, I did more than 13 years ago, um, even though it was just reprint, it was also reprinted. You know, it's been a popular book. It has it has a good longevity. It wasn't a bestseller, but it's grown and grown in um, popularity as time goes by, as people become more aware. And so... Um, the first book is American Indians. Legends of the Star Ancestors is the international indigenous take on it, from Japan to Islam to Jerusalem to Aboriginal Australian to mm-hmm. Tibetan. I mean, I really tried to cover representatives from all Africa, from all indigenous people to to try to weave, uh, you know, a tapestry. In, in a in a global sense of what the relationship is to the cosmology and to these these beings. This is all a new subject to me, and not not in terms of ufology or all the the whole barrage of uh, concepts, you know. But in the Native American tradition, I hadn't been aware of it until I watched Ancient Aliens, and I went, um, you know, this is some fascinating stuff because. Here you have a culture that really talks sense, they talk spirituality, they talk about the care of Mother Earth and humanity. He's a, from what I see and from what I gather of the Native American tradition is that these guys are very, very serious people and they talk about serious stuff. They, they have a very good presence about them when, when they speak, you know, and, and yourself too, Nancy. So, you know, I stand up and listen when I, when I hear people speak like that, and especially from cultures like that and rich cultures. You know, and uh, yeah, and because of the prophecies and the unfolding of this 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 move from one world into another, um, people are speaking out more. When I first started, it was still very taboo to yeah. talk about this because it was one of the things that is secret and sacred in the sense that you have to be really careful how you um, approach the information and and how you speak on it because it has such. Uh, a uh, a strong um, impact on people and also such power in the mystery of it, you know. 
and so you can't just go out and, and, and willy-nilly do it. So the problem, not only the problem in the UFO community is you can only believe about 5% of what you hear, it's also that it's it's dominated by by the same people that have always been talking, you know. <laughs> it's you know, and so this is this is the information that is really special and really plays into what's going on right now on the planet. Um there were a lot of warnings and instructions that came through particularly about one of the main reasons I did the book was also not only about the propaganda against this subject in terms of the Bible, in terms of Christianity, in terms of science, in terms of Madison Avenue, but also to put forth the teachings and the instructions that come through on how to caretake the planet. Oh, I think we could all learn lessons from, from the Native American tradition, especially what's going on now. And I know that's that's the that prophecy that has to be told now, and that the time is now for this to come out. And I think there's, a, there's an evolving consciousness. I definitely see that. Um, I think we're up against it, against these guys in control. I mean, the Irish people are being suppressed as we speak, like uh, with financial control and you know so we're we're kind of wanting to stand up you know but i think the native american cultures have definitely got something to tell us and, and, and prophecies is it's the time is all here like you know i, I really feel that and I, I guess these sky ancestors are going to come back one day nancy yeah that's part of one prophecy well you know it is part of a prophecy um that they will come back with the high high technology see what what probably is going to happen is the Va- if the Vatican is destroyed, the Vatican already owns sixty percent of Jerusalem. That that uh, Shimon Peres signed it over to them, and their plan is to build the third Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. And in order to do that, they have to sign a seven-year peace accord. And if they do have a peace accord, they have to have a threat. You see, they continually have to have a a a propaganda threat to keep the wheels of their business going, which is the war machine. That is their business. That's how they make their money. And um, if they have a peace accord, which is signed by the Pope in Jerusalem, that all nations come to peace, that's when they want to install a one-world religion. And at the same time, they have to have a threat, and that's when they're going to have an alien threat, because 95% of the UFO craft that people see are government craft. You know, their exotic weaponry that was brought over here on Project Paperclip after World War II. They got all the scientists over here, and they've developed, they already, Hitler already had electromagnetic propulsion systems running off free energy because he wanted to be free, independent of the fossil fuel sellers. That was, well, that was where, because he was funded from over here initially, from the United States, and that's where things really went awry is because he wanted he wanted to break away from the oil sellers. So he had developed extensive technologies that were uh, fossil fuel free. I mean, the greatest scientists were in Germany. We know that. You know, Victor Schauberger, the father of implosion, he's the one that created the first implosive engine, which was not a violent. Um, and, you know, he lived up here in Taos for a while because he secretly worked at Los Alamos. And what's really interesting is he got a lot of his ideas from talking to some of the Indian people about the vortex, yeah, the theory of a vortex in water. You know, his implosion engine, which is electromagnetic, which is what these vehicles run off, is based on the power of a vortex, a double vortex. And he saw that by spending time with Indian people, and they taught him about this power of a vortex in the water. I mean, he, you know, it's a secret, so it's hard to discover anything about the time he did spend here, but I have it from sources on the Pueblo that he was here. Yeah, you know, and, and of course, don't forget all the Nazis went over to NASA as well. They dragged all them over because they were super engineers. They wanted their brains, like, you know. Oh, yeah, a lot of them ended up in this part of the country, up in northern New Mexico, because of all of the labs, you know. You've got White Sands, you've got Alamogordo, you've got Los Alamos. I mean, when you think about it, all of the radar technology that was being developed, which can bring down a vehicle actually when it's low and slow, if there is an actual vehicle in here from another craft. But they don't need craft to come here. They only use those for protection. So 
somebody suggested to me there not too long ago that you know that as you say like that the, these carafts are something could be like hologram holographic images and that like you know what we're seeing up there isn't perhaps half of it could be like government holographic images like to, for disinformation or whatever purpose yeah, I was told by quite a few elders that they travel in orbs. Yeah, uh, it's something else in the book that I... Because the book's full of so much information, Nancy. Well, it's amazing, isn't it? You look at it and you think, okay, I'm going to read this. But then it's very deep. When I started the book, I I, I, I was surprised because I didn't know where it was going to go. Well, I, I obviously titled Native American Tradition and I was like curious what way it would go. But there's, there's a lot of extra curricular information in there that I wasn't even aware of. And I'm pretty well read on some things, you know. And one thing I... I wasn't aware that Richard Hogan had been interested in the Mars interest and, and Indian legends and, and that. Perhaps you tell us a bit, a little bit about Richard's interest. Well, one of my elders when I was, you know, I used to do a lot of work with the Abenaki Nation. That's why they brought me in as a, as a part-time citizen because I had an arrest warrant because we were issuing our own license plates because... The Abenaki never signed a treaty with the United States government. So we had developed our own license plate. And, you know, the war chief, Homer St. Francis, when he got a ticket for that license plate, he'd turn around and give the police a ticket for trespassing. So we were um, doing a lot of fish-ins and, um, up there in Vermont. So they made me a member to protect me from uh, any issues I might have with that license plate. But um, I was trying to figure out where, what, what was I... What was and the, Richard Hogland and Oh, yes. Yeah. So Molly Masadakwis Keating who was an Obamswin. She was Abenaki from family from Canada. Mm. She went to the UN and met Richard Hoagland, and he he was looking for her because he wanted to correlate the statement, we come from the stars, to a planets of origination for the races. And it was Hunbat's man in, in, when I went down to... Uh, South America and Central America who confirmed that each race has its planet of origination. And so, of course, we always talk about the Pleiades and we talk about the Milky Way, but there are some tribes that, um, like the Aboriginal people, say they're from Sirius. So there are very, um, and so do the African people. So there are very specific planets that affect cultures. Something my own research has touched on too, Nancy, that, you know, this the Dogon tribe have links with the megalithic culture of, of Ireland here. And, uh, you know, their the art is the same. Their symbology is the same. They talk about black tribes having come to build a megalithic civilization. And, uh, you know, it's it's just washed out of the record. You know, the archaeologists don't like that. You know, the, you're not allowed you're not allowed to talk about that. You know, it's, that's a different thing. And um, I think you touched on chemotology. I heard you on a show one time, and I shared a philosophy of chemotology too. I think we, we synchronize on that as well, um, Nancy. Uh, yeah, because uh, there is there is a relation. You see, my name in Cherokee is Nimia Chikachi. That's a, that's a Cherokee name. Now, that name actually has its origins from summer, from Samaria. And I was recently talking to an elder, a Mohawk elder, who said that, um, um, who confirmed, uh, among other elders, that, you know, because the Cherokee always wore turbans, Arabic turbans. But our language is from the Middle East because that's where we, we, we migrated from. You talk about the ancient Irish having the, the old bardic law, the old bard, as they call it, having like very similar to Sumerian law and that the Sumerian annotations in there in the Gaelic, uh, the pre-Gaelic language. Well, of course, and you know that um, America by Sea by Barry Fell, he was from New Zealand, but he was a linguist at Harvard, and he traced languages like the Mi'kmaq language. He said it's identical to Egyptian hieroglyphics, and the Zuni language was like the Libyan language, and, you know, he related through the languages this source this migrate these migrations. So Hoagland, Hoagland takes this Indian legend. Uh, I'd never heard this before. So did, what what was Hoagland's verdict on this? Did he did he want to associate it with his belief of, of the cultures that were on Mars? Well, you know, um, he didn't delve in it too far. He he kind of played around with that idea, but I don't think people would talk to him. You know, and again, back in that day, it just wasn't something that people were speaking on it. It'd be different today because there's more, there's a couple more people who are speaking about it um, than, than then. 
but as far as uh, I don't think he really went out on a limb on that idea, but he saw the correlation, and he spoke about it at the United Nations in uh, you know in in one of his lectures. How come Richard was at the United Nations? Um, why did he go? Because he, why did he go to the United Nations? Yeah. Um, because he went to do a presentation on his thesis of um, the artifacts that were found on Mars and relating them. He did. He had done vinyl overlays of the edifices on Mars and their relationship to each other at 19.5 degrees, and then did those vinyl overlays over. Silbury in England, and they were exactly the same, the same 19.5 degrees to the horizon. I didn't know he had done that as a presentation to... Uh... Yeah, I've got the presentation. Oh, that's fascinating. It's very interesting. Actually, it is interesting. Um, yeah, this 19.5 degrees is something that appears all the time, isn't there? I think there's some pyramids at 19.5 degrees as well. Exactly, and so are the edifices on Mars are at the same 19.5 degrees. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's funny enough, I had somebody talk to me about Mars the other day, and they were talking, you know, maybe that we were evolved here once, and that we went to Mars, and I don't think it matters which way it went, whether Mars came here or we came there, but, you know, there's a part of our story missing, and perhaps, as you say, you know, there was more cultures, that we, we had, each had our own planet at one point. Um, well, I think there have been nuclear wars before, and, in, 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 uh, you know, which destroyed... It seems like, from my understanding, through these, you know, we've emerged through four worlds. That's that's yeah, that's pretty much what I what I understand is that we've and we're emerging from the fourth world and the fifth world. But the, each one of these worlds that had its peak ascension and then fall um, could be re- related to the abuse of technology. And that there have been nuclear wars. It, it's written in the Mahatabharata about the nuclear wars and the elephants being melted on the ground. I mean, if if you go back into some of the ancient texts like that, it does talk about there being nuclear wars before. Didn't they quote the uh, Mahabharata at the testing of the atomic bomb? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Winston Churchill's nephew, Sir Lord um, Desmond Leslie, have you ever listened to any of his interviews? No, but I'm going to... He worked, well, he worked with George Adamski, and I have a chapter of him, uh, of, of his lecture in my book, Life with the Cosmos Clearance, and he really well, well spoken and very interesting man talking about this subject um, and how he interpreted the translation in... Uh, of a floral um, um, an interpretation of the Mahatabharata. And, you know, there's a literal and there's a floral. And you can find it on YouTube if you Google Sir Desmond Leslie. Yeah, I have the nephew. Yeah, Sir Desmond Leslie. Yeah, really listen to him. I don't think he's alive. If he is, he's over there in England. But what a fascinating man. He wrote a couple books, uh, co-authored a book with George Adamski. Mm. And he was speaking out about this uh, a while, uh, long time ago. That's what I love about my radio show, Nancy, to get on people like yourself and, and get some knowledge flowing. And then you, you just get some something dropped in your lap, like a YouTube video to go, look, and it spurs you on again for more research. And, and you know, yeah. this is the beauty of internet podcasting. You know, I, I talk to the other hosts, and it's fascinating. You know, the internet is a beautiful thing. Well, it's interesting because Dan Salter, who was in the Disclosure Project, you know, I, I interviewed a lot of guys in that project. Um, mm-hmm. Until, unfortunately, I found out the, a lot of the funding sources came from the Clintons and the Rockefellers because they really do have an agenda with this alien threat. Oh, yeah. Obviously, you can see it in the media. Um, and um, he always said that the extraterrestrials seeded the Internet. Yeah. You know, the technology, they seeded it here so that it could be made available because now everybody uses the internet for research you know you can't get anything on i mean i don't i don't have a television but mm. um, myself it's just yeah it ain't the way to go to try to get it from the propaganda machine yeah it's like a joke the news that's been rolled out these days it's is, a joke it's absolutely shocking it's not there's, there's so little news in it if anything i'm, I'm surprised yeah. i'm surprised any news makes it in now it's like uh 
it's just the world's theatrical game, if you ask me. The, the news. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty obvious, and I think and people are waking up to it more and more. And yeah, more. I agree with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree with that. So, um, do you know what I liked about the book is that you talk, you mention these characters, Harriet Goodluck and Oscar Rodriguez and uh, Humboldt's man. I can't I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and Paul Duarte as well. Like you know, amazing guy, huh? Oh man. Tell me a little bit about Paul Duarte because he's a. It's you, you get this sense of character that you portray these people, and and that's nice because you're. It's not just a, a non-fiction book; it's a non-fiction book with a depth of character to the people in it as well. And I like that. You know, that that's what I liked about it the most, Nancy. Well, he's he's an amazing individual. He's Olmec in German, so he has. Mm. He's 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 like multilingual. He he was a esoteric tour guide in uh, Chiapas and in Mexico, interpreting the temples from the point of view that we're speaking of. And, uh, of course, that did bring him, you know, problems within Mexico itself for that interpretation uh, because they didn't want that information out. But, for instance, in the university in um, Palenque, up in Palenque in Chiapas, after the uh, the archaeologists, you know, they scrape through layers of walls. They keep taking things apart, you know, and they kept taking the walls off um, till they got to the first set of paintings and drawings on the first wall that went up in the university for students. And all along the top of the corners of of this university room were, were pictures, glimpses, of UFO craft with the pods coming down. And so what he would do is he would relate some of the the information that he put out in, in terms of education uh, for esoteric tours mm. to the real truth of what went on, what on went on yeah. over there um and their relationship to the visitors mm-hmm. the it, ancient uh, astronauts really Sure. I, I think we had spoke about Maurice Cotterell because he, he had looked into the Lydia Palenque and Maurice told me recently that they have now squared, because Maurice's uh, images um, of the Lydia Palenque where he overlays me, this super science that's on that actual Lydia Palenque is to do mm-hmm. notch, notch of the corner of the Lydia Palenque. But they mm-hmm. he told me that they've now squared it off. They've plastered off the square that you squared the corners off. Oh, I'm sure they have. They're destroying. Matter of fact, this morning I just found out they destroyed in Peru a 4,000 year old um, ancient pyramid. And they also destroyed the Nazca lines in Peru. Did you hear about that? No. I only come back from Peru, Nancy, in, in April. I went there for three weeks. Really? Yeah. I, I, I actually took ayahuasca with a shaman and uh, to experience the shamanic experience in a quite lovely, beautiful setting. I really, uh, I, I wanted to experience it with a shaman. And uh, obviously, I was there. You can't get it over here. It's, it's. Uh, I, I had a time of my life. I seen all the ancient monuments that I could in about a week and a half, and uh, the ayahuasca. And then I hiked along the Andes to Machu Picchu. And you know, to see, you see this archaeological standpoint that this is all Inca. It's all 1600s, and I'm like. These guys haven't got a clue. There's obviously, oh, I'm an engineer and physicist, Nancy. I'm looking at this stuff with an alternative viewpoint, and I have that alternative viewpoint. But, you know, mm-hmm. there's Inca and there's pre Inca, and this stuff's gone back thousands of years. You can clearly see the different stages of construction. Yeah, it was very interesting to me. I interviewed a, a uh, Sapqua a friend of mine who's a doll maker from Alaska. She's Sapqua Indian, and she grew up on Kodiak Island, and she told me that. 2,000 years ago, her people were doing brain surgery and that what what she's been told through her people was that they came up from Peru. Really? Yeah. So, of course, we'd have to go into the Vatican archives to get the true history of this planet. We've been just totally, totally led astray. I think if you got into the Vatican archives, I don't think you'd ever get out again. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd have you locked in there with everything else. <laughs> That's right. Man, I'd yeah. love to be in there to have, see what they've got in there, Nancy. Oh um, man, they've got all all of it. They've got everything, and then they they wrote all these other books to just uh, control people. But the real information is what they actually worship in reverse. You know, what a weird organization the Vatican, because it is all, for all intensive purposes just like a country. It's just like a industrial organization. 
Yeah, I mean, they're really the bankers. When people talk about the bankers, uh, the ro- the banker robbers, the Vatican Bank owns all the banks, you know. And some of the, the vicious costumes there, like uh, Babylonian fish costumes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're definitely, they definitely worship Nimrod. Mm. And in the name of that, you know, of course, they're controlled by the, the Jesuits, which is the Sinom, you know, the... Mm. Sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta. Yeah, yeah. That is, they are they they are an intelligence organization. They, the Jesuits have nothing to do with religion. Yeah, I just come back from Malta too because there's ancient places over there. Man, that place is weird. That, Malta. Yeah. Yeah. Bizarre mysteries over there. It used to be a good place, Ibiza yeah. and Malta, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, like uh, it's it's had such a mix of people come in there, you know, from Arab. Yeah. To the Knights of Malta, and you know the uh, what you call them. Uh, you know, people don't realize that Jerusalem, mm. the Islam, and Christianity is all run through the Vatican. Mm. It's all, you know, it's all part. It had all been initiated through this uh, for this heretic Inquisition, which is what we're seeing right now. Sure, that's why. That's I mean, on the on the war of principalities. Not and and the oil is a byproduct and the and the heroin is a byproduct, you know. But the main thrust or the main drive for why they're doing it is a religious, you know, it's a principle war because they want to seat their god Lucifer on Mount the holiest of holies. Mm. That is that is why they're going to Jerusalem, and of course Shimon Peres is a knight of Malta. Yeah. So, you know, he agreed to giving, uh, selling 60% of Jerusalem to the Vatican. And, and, you know, I don't think all of the Israeli people are even aware of that. But they are going to move the Vatican to Jerusalem. It's so insane what goes on behind closed doors, this master game that gets played out. So Yeah, it would be good when it's over. It's just such a waste of time, you know, because actually in the end, the light, the light brothers... Um, um, are returning. Uh, you know, they are coming back and they will... Mm-hmm. Sooner the better. Okay, uh, I just wanted to... Just uh, just going back to the little plank, eh, because I hadn't... Uh, I've, I've looked into cranial deformation um, quite, quite elaborately, like, just as a curiosity. and It never actually occurred to me that the, the Pakal, because you mentioned this in the book, you know, there's so much information in the book, extracurricular to... The, but the, the cranial deformation uh, of the Pakal is in the drawing. Like it never actually occurred to me that his head is cranial deformed. Like. Yeah, well, we did that too. That that indigenous people did that. And, and you say that's for to open the third eye chakra. Is that is that why? Is that, is that yes? I mean, it's part of. It was part of. Um, it was part of a a ritual. Um, you know, and and I have to go back and look at actually. I'd have to go back because my at, at my age, my memory is serving sure. not serving me too well. Um, what was the the purpose of that? And it might it might be exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I can't remember what I said in the book today. So, yeah, you. it's something like that. I I might have not maybe eloquently put it <laughs> very well, but uh, yeah, as to to help with the uh, chakra. Um, the yes, uh, yes, and that's that's why the Egyptians ate gold. People don't realize that gold. Yeah, if eating, I eat, I, I eat gold, ormus mana. Really? I, I make it, I bottle it, and also, because lately, I have been, I was on Whitley Strieber Coast to Coast, mm. and I harvest red clay and monoatomic gold in a, in a cave, yeah. Lawrence Gardner's work. Do you mind? I, I, I harvest it for radiation mitigation, because it protects you from radiation, and that's why they buried Chernobyl in red clay, and I just want to make... Wow. It available to people. If anybody needs any or wants any, they can contact me. I harvest it in a cave, and it has gold in it, and it helps to take the the fluoride out of the pineal gland. Yeah. See, that's why they put the fluoride in the water to stop this transmission, this this upgrade, this evolutionary step that we're supposed to be taking now. A lot of the listeners will be aware of this, Nancy, on the fluoride because uh, of a, particularly Ireland's been heavily fluoridated. They're campaigning to get it out of the water. 
Not only are they campaigning to get it out of the water, they're still putting it in there, and people are spending £700 for expensive nanotechnology fluoride filters. The whole population is, is putting in filters to get it out of the water. So therefore, Yeah, well, it's a, it's a pesticide that kills rats. Wow. I've got a picture of uh, your pineal gland before and after for, with fluoride, and, and it calcifies your pineal gland. So then you can't, you, you can't uh, make that... You can't utilize your abilities, and that's what this is all about. Because yeah, I have some, I have some guests coming uh, quite regularly on and off. I I do couch surfing. It's uh, I I open my doors to people that are traveling and struggle to travel, and I have a spare room here, and it's my way of giving some good karma out there. But I've got people cycling around Ireland and just young people traveling, and it's a nice way to com- make, communicate and meet people. But I had a young girl from Belgium there. She was a nurse, and I was. Because I don't let them drink the tap water here. I, I say, no, drink the bottled water, and I don't use the tap, and they explain why, because of the chlorine and because of the fluoride, and they go, oh, isn't fluoride good for teeth? And I went, that's what they tell you. <laughs> and I have to give them the fluoride rant, and I tell them all about the fluoride. But the Belgian uh, young girl, she was a nurse, she told me that they put it on baby's teeth when they're young. They rub it all over their teeth in Belgium. Well, they're spraying it now in the chemtrails. It's in the chemtrails now. It's a, it's a very dangerous um, it's a very dangerous substance. I mean, it was uh, the, was what Hit, Adolf Hitler used. That's where they got it. Mm-hmm. Started the whole chem uh, death mm-hmm. fluoride thing. I get so scared sometimes, you know, Nancy, when I think about what they're doing and, and what's going on and the corruption that goes on. The corruption of like the earth more than not, the actual the, the financial corruption. I mean, the corruption of our earth, like and our, our environment. I know. Well, they they want to do that so that they they you know a lot of it is intended. And if you've ever seen the Iron Mountain, and one of the things that they intended to do was create the pollution so that they could reorganize. You know, they want to take over all the rural areas and 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 stick everybody in cities. Yeah, and that's what Agenda Twenty One is all about. So part of mm-hmm. the propaganda they've created this situation um, with the pollution on purpose they're creating a lot of these situations on purpose because it helps them orchestrate this this agenda that they have Mm -hmm. and that came out of the covenant of iron mountain sure so nancy you've traveled around quite a bit because you didn't just quite easily get these stories from people you had to go to the different tribes because these oh yeah these tribes are quite scattered over america and central america too yeah, I went through uh, the Yucatan, uh, Central America, and um, all over the United States. And then a lot of the interviews that I did also in Legends is, um, you know, I had to conduct them. I couldn't go everywhere. Mm. Um, I conducted them, you know, over the telephone. I don't know if a lot of people know, but the, the Native American tribes once marched out of Central America. They all came from probably most likely to one source somewhere. Well, you know, the Bering Straits runs both ways. <laughs> I mean, you know. True. Uh, yeah, the the migrations have been iced in terms of, um, you know, what what the true history of this planet has not been uh, put forth. Yeah, it's not been properly documented the, the, the right way. Well, it's been documented, but it's been withheld. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the public, it's not been documented properly. Like it's part this. of their mystery school. Mm. Let's talk about Atlantis. Let's see where Atlantis puts into this, because there's quite talk of Atlantis in the book too, and and this is a subject that's dear to me because uh, I'm into lost cultures. This is my thing, Nancy. Like so, but um, tell us how Atlantis fits into the Native American tradition. Well, people in the Native American tradition don't really use the word Atlantis. You know, I mean, they don't really speak of it. Per se, they talk of it in terms of, you know, because you're talking about a translation of the languages that are very diverse. So sure. they talk about it in terms of, of moving through civilizations and moving through worlds and be, worlds being destroyed. Mm-hmm. So it comes in the form of a teaching or an instruction more so than a archaeological or, you know, metaphysical sense. Mm. Because they've actually found the pyramids in the Caribbean lately. They've got some amazing pictures of some of the 
mm. Caribbean artifacts that they've the pyramids they've discovered sure. down in in uh, the Caribbean. So yes, um, one thing I know from um, um, some people I interviewed who are in the Caribbean on the third Star Ancestors, which for some reason my publishers wouldn't put out, and it was at the time because I interviewed Leonard Peltier in Fort Leavenworth Prison. And at that time, he was going for his clemency, and and they wouldn't put that book out. But there was a man in there who was uh, from Barakain, from the, which is Barakain is Puerto Rico, the the sons and daughters of Atabesh. And if you look at Atabesh, Atabesh just looks like the Cocopelli, you know, the 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 seed carrier, which they call him a flute player, but he really is a seed carrier, and. Um, and that he said that at at that time, he's the only person that really got into it, and he said at that time, all of the tr- indigenous people would meet around that area of Puerto Rico. They would come and meet together. It was a ceremonial site because the womb of Mother Earth is in that area. You know, that Mother Earth has organs in there. The heart is here. The kidneys are here. You often hear that from Indian people that they reside in the lungs or in the heart of the world or but in terms of of what he said is that that was the womb of Mother Earth, and that all of the different indigenous people would come from all directions to do ceremony there and I think he was speaking about Atlantis, sure, sure, but he wouldn't use that word because that word is a translation. I mean, you know, Plato, but it wasn't called that, you know. It was a ceremonial center for the womb of of the mother. Fascinating, fascinating. I know, I know. It was a very interesting interview with this guy. Tell me about the Hale-Bopp messenger, Um, because this is something that happened quite recently in our time, and me being into astronomy, I think think that was a messenger, you know, and certainly when uh, when they speak about it. Um, you mean from the interview with yeah. Humbatsman? Yes, about the yeah Humbatsman. He talks about Hale Bach the comet as the messenger. That it's a sign of the changing times. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, traditionally comets have been thought of in that way. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, well, I actually on that subject. Um, I don't know. Much more than that about that it's subject. Fascinating ideas from you know. I just know. Uh, from what he said, yes, he said it was a messenger, and of course they talk about a blue star and a red star. You know, saying that the blue star, uh, the sign of a blue star, in this age would be the sign of the confirmation of a prophecy mm. being fulfilled. Of course, that would be a good idea of a prophecy because it's got a period, periodic return all the time. So I can see how, obviously, there has to be some mechanism for the prophecy to be told. And what what better way than a comment? That's well, yeah, not all prophecy is fulfilled because prophecy is like a warning. It's like an instruction. And if humanity heeds the warning or the instructions, then the fulfillment of that prophecy can be changed. You know, nothing is written in stone. It's up to the humanity. Um, And that's why the waking up of humanity is so important at this time because we can't really move forward if people are walking zombies or walking in their sleep. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people in that state. That is the state of dumbing down, you know, the deliberate dumbing down of the population. Sure. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating, fascinating. You know, and I also think the uh, this fluoride thing that they it's, it's not only just dumbing down. I think people are more intuitive than we really know. And I think, you know, as you talk about in the back of the book about developing your psychic powers, and you know, I think everybody has this innate ability. But I think that's also why the fluoride is there. This intuitive knowledge, this way other way of knowing things, is being taken away from us through the fluoride. It's not just to make us not calculate or not know language. It's not an academic dumbing down. It's actually quite a spiritual dumbing down and a, a metaphysical dumbing down. Would you agree with that? Well, yes, and that's why, you know, uh, ayahuasca has a little brother, and it's in the form of a T from Ecuador, 
And what's really interesting, I wanted to tell you about this because um, I drink that in the morning, and what it does is it helps also clean the floor. It's really important to to um, really work on tr- attempting to clean the fluoride, you know, to, to get these chemicals out of there because that's where we receive information and transmission. And um, there's, there's a tea. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but... Sure, go for it. Gaiusa. Gaiusa. Okay. It's G-A-Y-U-S-A. You can just look it up, gaiusa.com. Oh, you can get that out. You, so. <laughs> do you drink that? No, but if I can get my hands on it, I will be drinking it. Yeah, you should. You should because what happens is it's the little brother to the ayahuasca. It's mm. it's very subtle, but what it does is, and I want to tell you this: the night the night before you sent me the email about having to change the date, I I had a dream at two in the morning, and it was that you canceled the show. Really. Yeah, and so I went to the internet. I woke up. I thought, "Oh shit!" I wonder. Excuse me. I, I wonder if uh, he had to cancel the show. And so it was two o'clock in the morning. I don't know. I guess that's seven. I'm not sure what time it was your time, but at two, o'clock, I hadn't gotten the email about the show, and I thought, "Uh oh, he's going to change the date of the show." So when I woke up later, because I had to go back to sleep, um, I got the email from you that he changed the date. Would you believe I've had a feeling that you were you knew that? that you, <laughs> I so, did. Because I was thinking, because you're quite a spiritual person, and the thing is, I've met some quite spiritual people. I had a psychic on the show, and she was she's a Scorpio, and I she's quite, you know, very intuitive, and she seemed to know things about me. And like the same thing happened with her. I had to we cancel the show, and I don't like canceling shows. I really hate it, like because I I really try and stick to my schedule, and sometimes I just things change like you know and she knew the same thing as well and i went yeah is he gonna know <laughs> it's like so well we all have that ability see and that's what's being denied us by by particularly by fluoride but it, mm-hmm. there's a whole lot of things that are affecting that you know the nanotechnology and the chemtrails i mean they're spraying fluoride from the air too mm-hmm. and so we have to be really vil- vigilant yeah vigilant about trying to stay uh, build our immune system and that's that tea also helps with that which is great if i can source that i will nancy i definitely will uh, yeah you know what the great thing about the ayahuasca was for me other than just you know the shamanic and the, i mean i was i'm spiritually in a good place you know and i know people take ayahuasca for that spiritual transformation but i didn't think it was going to have that spiritual transformation on me because i'm such a happy lucky go lucky type of guy you know i ditched a massively paid career to go and follow my dream you know and i'm so happy i am doing what i want to do you know i'm in a great place i'm working on myself spiritually i'm meditating i'm you know i'm doing all lots of good stuff and i'm in a good place in my life you know and but like you know I just jumped spiritually, like, you know, coming out of that. And, like, I, not when I thought I couldn't, like, you know, I thought it was, you know, there. So, you know, it surprised me. It really did, you know. And um, such a beautiful substance, like, you know. And it's like, you, the, the beautiful thing about Peru and, and the Amazon is that they have the right to take this. This is like a sovereignty that these guys have, you know. That this, this they have the right to explore their own consciousness. And, yeah. And the West Yeah, I've never I I mean I don't I don't feel driven uh, or n- necessary for me to do that. Mm. But um there are other but I'm a I do collect and harvest a lot of medicine myself and I I rely completely on on that medicine. I don't go to a doctor. So I've really done a lot of research and and one of the things that I've come up with is the clay the red clay and the monoatomic gold has really, really helped me. I I had more gallons, really, from the chemtrails, and I cured it with the red clay. That's fascinating. Now. I I have only one or two little spots, you know, left because they're constantly spraying me. They go right over my farm, That's and sick. the beauty of it is, is I drink the red clay and I eat the gold and that's what the Egyptians did they did it for a reason because it helps this transmutation of our being into into the cosmic cosmic vision I had watched a documentary presentation by a guy called Lawrence Gardner I don't know if you know him he, uh, I've heard of him yeah he, he, he had talked about that he looked at the uh, ancient Egyptian Menon cut I think they had this special bread where they put the monatomic gold into it 
and uh, they were able to be light beings. They they're, they were sentient light beings, you know, that they enhanced themselves spiritually and transformed themselves. But, now say that again. Uh, I think it was Menonkut. They, they, this, this bread, this special bread where they put this monatomic white powdery substance into. Um, this gold. I make it. I make the monatomic gold and get it out to people too. I have water... I mix it with water from Ken Indusche or water from uh, Glastonbury. And yes, it does. Gold is the highest form of antibiotic. Mm. And also, um, you know, here in the old, before colonial contact, the Pueblo people used to go down and get gold nuggets when people were sick and they'd take them home and boil them and drink the water. I mean, it'll, 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 it's the best medicine there is. And, and uh, I've also read research that when uh, people with maybe disabilities like Down syndrome or something like that, when they take monatomic gold, their their brain, their IQ, their their uh, intelligence jumps like, you know, it, it, it gets enhanced like, you know, they become more, uh, a better mental age, if you want to call it that. Um, well, yeah, and you mix it with the red clay, which is an unbelievable substance itself. It's it is the life, it is the life force. Clay is the life force, and it's hard to find the mortamelian, but it, it's up here in these caves and in, in at the base of the Rio Grande. You know, it would make sense, right, that the red clay is in there, but it has silver, it has copper, and it has titanium, and it, it has. You can't find any. You can't find in vegetables the kind of mineral compounds that you can find in clay. Sure. And so I harvest it. I mean, I, you know, I just shipped out like, I don't know. I'm still working on an order I got off coast to coast because it takes me a lot of time. I got to go down there. It's it's. I got to hike up into the cave. I have to dig it. I have to bring it home. I've got to clean it. I have to sift it. I have to strain it. I make it into a very, very fine powder, and you can see the gold flakes in there. You might have another yeah. market in Ireland. <laughs> you might get a few more <laughs> orders over. I hope so, yeah, uh, and then um, people drink it. What a wealth of information you are, uh, Nancy, I have to say. Now, this is this is all new to me, some of this stuff, you know. Uh, um, you know, do you think then with these chemtrails that there's, there's... See, I have a lot of mixed reports about chemtrails. I have to do a show on chemtrails. I can't wait to do it. And I have a couple of shows on environmental issues and stuff, but... Now, I heard all sorts of weird stuff. Personally, I think they're culling the, co the population. They want to just... But I hear people saying they're trying to block out the sun because there's harmful radiation. Well, they're doing solar dimming. Oh, definitely, because they've created global warming. Because when they do these spraying and they use the heart program to create these hurricanes and tornadoes, they they put huge, huge mega watts of radiated energy into the atmosphere. And that's what's creating the global warming. It has nothing to do with the planetary cycle. Tesla technology. And that's why they're doing global dimming to hide what they've done to the environment through the use of this HARP program in Alaska. And so as far as the... Um, Purpose, the, the chemtrails have multiple purposes. Yes. Multiple, multiple purposes. Yes, it is part of the, 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 the culling. It's also part of controlling the weather and gearing storms to go in certain places. They're creating these, these monster storms. Yeah. I had a, a girl with me there, and she was like, you know, going on to the chemtrail. She wanted to know, because I'm a bit sciencey, and she asked me what I thought, and I went, well... I said, I do know this much that, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet and they only want 500 million. They just want to get that number down. It's well, yeah, there's also something called disaster capitalism. See, when they create these storms on Wall Street, they make bets on it. Really? The only reason Wall Street is still up and running is because of the drug business. And now they've got a new business. It's called disaster capitalism. And they bet on these storms before they hit because they know they're coming. And they bet, no, it's going to wipe out the crops. No, it'll do this, it'll do that. I'm going to bet on on, on that we're going to get in there and rebuild uh, because of such and such. And they bet, make bets on Wall Street and they make money off the storm. I've come to believe, Nancy, that there's two types of people out there, psychopaths and good people. <laughs> Like yeah, well, the the Hopi put it pretty good when they said the one-hearted and the two-hearted. The, <laughs> the one-hearted and the two-hearted. Yeah, that's their, that's in their prophecy at Oribe. 
mm-hmm. you know, on the Prophecy Rock, you know, that there would be these people and they would be taking a, a that they're taking a path to oblivion. Mm-hmm. That's ultimately where they're going to end up. And the Hopi name means chakra, doesn't it? This crown chakra. I didn't know that as well. Huh? The Hopi name, it actually means crown chakra. What you mean, yes, and the Hopi and, and um, the Maya and the Hopi, the, the language has a relationship. In the book, Paul is talking about it. Yeah. Yeah, the Hopi, it's the crown chakra. Fascinating. Yeah, but it, they're called the peace, people of the peace the peaceful people, but the other meaning behind it, yes, is the crown chakra, because that is this age of the awakening of the crown chakra, yeah. So, you mentioned crop circles in the book, too. Do you, you think that the, these crop circles are messages for us, Nancy? I think some of them are generated by governments, a lot of them, most of them. Keep yeah. Uh, they, they have also have natural phenomena, though. Yeah. Of course, they copy everything, you see, and then they turn it around Twist and it. use it. Yeah. Twist it again. Twist it. But, um, yeah, I think they're not, they, they were a cosmic message, but, of course, like every message, they've got to control that message. Okay, Nancy, tell us your website. Tell us what you got there. Tell us what to look out for, because you got a, a, a documentary from them as well, Star Ancestors. And I, I do. I've got a link I, to that on the CapricornRadio.com homepage, so if you can't find Nancy, you'll find her there. But yes, I'm going to leave that one there for you too, Nancy. I think it's a fascinating documentary, so tell us about that, your website, what you're doing, and conferences that you're speaking at as well, if you if you have any. Well, right now, I've just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about... I've been working on that documentary for a number of years, and it's always the, on the last leg of um, whether or not I can raise that money for editing because, you know, it does cost. Oh. I mean, I, I don't want to just do it myself. I'm not an editor, although I can do a rough cut. Yeah. So, you know, that that is really up to the creator whether or not that film will come out because I just don't have the funds to finish it, and... You just can't make it up, you know. Mm-hmm. I, can, I want it to be done in a certain way. I do have some great, actually a great sound engineer. I've got a great guy to do the soundtrack. Uh, John Trudell did the theme song, and Dean Stockwell narrates, and it's interview. It's a really profound movie. Um, but the, the 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 pollution in the UFO community is so great that I wouldn't want to destroy the purity and the clarity of the books sure. by putting something out there that gets attacked, that gets thrown upside down, that you know, that loses any credibility because the the books are fairly pure. I'm sure I got a few people that I interviewed that were agents. I love the artwork in it too, Nancy. The artwork yeah. and it was beautiful, you know. It's... So I'm waiting just as part of the creator. I mean, I know, you know, I, I can't go forward without that. Um, so in the meantime, what I've been doing is just dealing with uh, journalism and, and reporting and following the nuclear issue very much because it's so bad. It was so bad here. Whatever happened and, to Fukushima? Because I haven't heard anything about that in the news since. It's just a no... Oh, well, that... that, that <laughs> No there have been many people died on the west coast of California from Fukushima already. Really? But they're, they're, you know, the only way you can get into the documents is through the Freedom of Information Act on the Nash, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Mm-hmm. And there's a 50,000-page thing of data. I just did get something about how many people have died on the west coast already from it. Wow. But they're not, putting, they're not uh, telling people. Unbelievable. And that's why I'm really been working on trying to get this message out about eating clay because they buried Chernobyl in clay, not not the right kind because Bennonite clay is not as strong as the Mortimelian, but it, it does protect you from radiation. Yeah. And people need to be protecting themselves because that nuclear fallout is traveling the globe every 45 days. I mean, it didn't just come around once. It's continually traveling the globe and dropping on people through the rain and in our water and yeah. Mm. Crazy times, you know. The, the whole planet, this Mother Earth is just being attacked, attacked time and time again. She is like, um, you know, you, you think she's going to reclaim herself and just 
Just oh, definitely, she will. I mean, I you know, from what I've heard, I talked to a group of Cree elders um, who are part of a, a Star Blanket clan up in Canada, and uh, they said that the the actually ancient astronauts came in to to talk to them to tell them, that, and they had on military uniforms when they came in, and they said they were going to take out the heart machine, and they're going to cut off. They'll probably end up having to cut the electricity all over the planet because that's the only way to stop what's going on if you think about it really yeah if they lose their grid then it's a major weakness in there yeah they can't go forward with that and i think that the star wars you know they are they are looking to have a war in space they are already got nuclear weapons parked 600 miles out in space they are looking to have a confrontation in space, and they're making it look like the extraterrestrials, the UFO people, are the bad ones. They're the boogeyman. They're the green men. They do this. They do that. They abduct you. And it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm just trying to wake up as many people as I can. And, That's it. And uh, sometimes even if it's just one at a time, Nancy. That's what I yeah. do. And I, I've got people coming to my door, and I, I open my doors, and I do this thing, and... You know, I, I'm surprised that people are actually listening to me now. I mean, I couldn't have done that five years ago and ten years ago. That's uh, great that you help people like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, I actually get quite a nice... I mean, I'm in a very remote part of Ireland, Nancy, you know, and I go, I've got a nice place here. I overlook the coast. On the, I'm on the coast. So of, you're in Ireland. I'm sorry. I thought you were in England. Yeah, no, I see. Because we have our British oppressors uh, have taken part of Ireland and you haven't given it back to us yet. So yeah, in Northern Ireland, at the very top, at the very very top right hand corner. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the Irish are they're they're good people. Yeah, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I mean, this show goes out live on the MSI Radio Network, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people here and, and talking truth and seeking solutions, and you know, they're gonna love this show as well when it goes out on Monday, Nancy. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, like you know, I'm yeah, I mean. They call it the UK here, but it's Ireland to us. Geographically, it's Ireland. But, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I mean, so I get a lot of people traveling here and coming around the country, and I'm surprised that, you know, I, I have a guy who came yesterday, he's from New Zealand, and he's talking about the corruption of the government and the political games that's been going on. And, you know, he's a mechanical engineer too, so, you know, and which is what I've done, in mechanical engineering and, and physics and stuff. And I wasn't expecting him I, to be like that because, I mean, five years ago, I, I mean, you couldn't talk to people in, in mechanical engineering or physics. I mean, I, I, I once told a physicist I was working with that I, I researched Atlantis and I'm into, like, lost cultures and he never spoke to me again. You know, he just thought... Well, I, how, how do people find you? How do people? Oh, I'm on a, like a website for uh, it's called couch surfing. It's like oh, okay, and that's how they find you to 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 come and visit it's you. Like a, it's like a profile system where you look at each other's profile, and if you don't like the person, you don't have to let them in, and so you kind wow. of take pictures and yeah, I've had people here coming and <laughs> just traveling around and just we go off hugging trees together in the forest and have a bit of a free spirit, like you know, I've met some very interesting people. Um, I've had a couple of young girls travel and they cook me dinner some night and then they just take so I have a spare room there like you know and I had a, a couple of cyclists come through quite regularly and you know you just get all walks of life and they're they're all nationalities like you're that's great yeah but like I mean they're all very interested in me and I tell them about me being an author Nancy and I tell them about you know it's stuff the radio shows that I do and like let me listen to your radio show where can we get it and like it's it's all in the archives and they get so excited and you know I get messages through and we're listening to your shows thanks for meeting you and all. so it's it's even publicity as well it's nuts like yeah really I'd love to have a radio show in Europe yeah you know and you know what as well Nancy a lot more people are listening to radio shows that are talking truth and that they're, they're talking oh definitely there's you can't yeah right it's true they're on the road, but I've done a lot of radio interviews. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I'm, I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm just so uplifted that the younger generation from, you know, because when I was their age, I was, I wasn't awake. I didn't wake up till I was in my late twenties, possibly. Uh -huh. You know, because I was drinking fluoride when I was younger, but didn't know it any better. But, uh, you know, I'm just so happy to see younger people. You know awake and aware and uh, listening to me like you know and I'm like maybe they just don't know it because they're young but like they are willing to take the information in when you present them with what fluoride is and they go oh well, I'm not going to drink that anymore you know and 
they they see in political games and they, they know that the propaganda is on the telly is the right and oh yeah they're they're a lot uh they're a lot smarter than we think yeah and I, and that's encouraging for me too you know so um mm-hmm. so yeah you know fascinating fascinating Nancy um I wanted to talk about the Anasazi because they are very very interesting well, they don't know a lot about them, but one thing I found out when I went down there to interview uh, the historian for the Diné, Navajo, and Anasazi people, mm. um, they were Pueblo people, actually, Anasazi, um, was that they were only three feet tall. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. And I was taken to, shown a crystal stargazing um uh, cave. Well, actually, I couldn't get up in there because it's way up in the ledges and the canyon. But that is where there's star maps, and that's where they did crystal stargazing. So they they had the ability. And this is the historian of the Diné Nation who told me this sure. about how they used the crystal stargazing for uh, finding lost people. Uh, they were able to predict the weather coming. They could also find out where to go hunting, and uh, so they were time travelers. Mm. Fascinating. Nancy, you did, a, you did a concert, a Roswell concert before, did you? Something like that? Did I hear? Well, that? actually, the concert was, was canceled because of the Heaven's Gate PSYOP. That was a CIA PSYOP. The Heaven's Gate, that's the suicide thing. Or was it? That was just a PSYOP, you know. They created that event. You know, like 95% of the news that people are watching is just it's all theater. Mm. It's all acting. People don't realize it, but they've cre- they're just totally propaganda. Yeah, I was t- And that event, yes, took out the Roswell concert that we were planning because when that happened, we lost our sponsors. Sure. I'm- so we had Frito-Lay, Budweiser, Pepsi, and everything for a big event in Roswell. And that when that event happened, that mass suicide, cyanide drinking PSYOP, um, we lost our funding. Right. And that's why they did it. They didn't want a lot of 150,000 people coming to Roswell for a rock concert. No way. They just wanted to... <laughs> God, the, the games that they played. I was telling my guest yesterday about like Sandy Hook and the Boston bombings and the joke that's getting played out in town. He's like, you know, he 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 knew 9-11 and the, the fallacy that that is, like, you know, and, you know, he, but he hadn't been aware of that, like, you know, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's sad that people don't really, they fall for it, but these are, it's all theater. Yeah. I've got some friends on YouTube that have t- picked that thing apart upside and Sunday, and it's amazing what they found out. Totally amazing. This is the thing, you wonder why they, they must, uh, I think they always say you only need about 20% of the population to swing the rest, or, well, not not the whole lot, but to swing the vote, as they say, like, you know, you only need about 20% to swing the vote. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there's a guy in London who who is one of the authorities on that. If you ever want to contact him on YouTube yeah. and do an interview, it would be a great thing to do. Awesome. And he's in London. Yeah? Yeah, as far as I know, he's in London. Who's this? I'll, I'll send you a video of his, okay? Yeah, do that, do that. So and then you could maybe contact him if you ever want to... I go to London once a month. Because uh, I have an airport right beside me here, and I got I can fly for twenty pounds in London. It's easier than going. Really? It's insane over here for flights, Nancy. It's like you can go in Europe like to twenty, thirty quid, like around cities. Like, I've really? Been, I've been to twenty-two countries in Europe. It's like, and they, people go really and go well. It's it's probably cheaper than the train sometimes. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't realize that. Yeah, well, that's one airline, right? That you have to book maybe two or three weeks in advance. But like, oh yeah, I, I used to live in Europe, so when I instead of going to college, I decided I better just go to Europe. Do it when you can. Wait, what part of Europe were you? Well, I lived in Paris. You know, I was I was um, I was playing in a band in Europe and up in Provence in the south of France. And I played flute, electric flute. So I was in Paris, and then we went up to the south of France to perform. And I spent quite a bit of time playing music in Europe when I was 18, 19. Mm, I love France. France is nice. It was great then. Passionate people. Yeah, it was really great. I never, I don't think I ever stayed in a hotel. I mean, people just put you, you know, they just, it was great. Mm. 
Yeah. That's what I love about Ireland is because this couch surfing thing that I do, people just open their doors here. I don't even lock my door here, Nancy. It's like so relaxed. Like it's, it's oh, I've never been to Ireland. I really oh, want to come see it. You got yeah. It's beautiful. Like you get the four seasons in the one day here. So really, yeah, yeah. It's like sunny. We were having breakfast this morning at a picnic table with the guy from New Zealand, and he says this is just like New Zealand. Like we were out sitting in the sun. He had to come in for the rain for two minutes and go back out in the sun again. It's like. You know, really? Then you got wind, rain, so it's like oh, everything. Then it's like back sunny again. It's great. Yeah. Within an hour, like. Yeah. But, uh, I only realised, Nancy, that I'm actually at the same latitude as Canada, Middle Canada, in, in the north of Ireland. Like, oh, really? Yeah, it's like up that fo- high, like so. Nancy, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. It really has. Um, so if you've if you've got any information you just want to give out, it's just Nancy Redstar is the main site to go to, and we can get you on Facebook as well. Yeah, and if anybody's interested in the gold or the the red clay and monoatomic gold or just the gold, liquid gold, you know, they could contact you and then you can give them my email. Sure. Well, I'm I'm interested myself, Nancy. I really am. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've actually been looking to maybe try monoatomic gold and, and, and sample it, but the, the ones that they're producing over in uh, Switzerland or wherever it is is like stupid money, crazy money, like. But Lawrence Gardner had said something about what you said, Nancy, that it's naturally in the soils. This, this it's in the soil, and the I, thing about it, I'll send you some information on the red clay because yeah. you really want to use both of them together because the red clay also removes all debris, all toxins, mm-hmm. fluoride, uh, chemtrail fibers, um, nanotechnology. It does it all, and I'll send you three pages of documents on how I get it and what I do, and yeah. I ask for donations. I don't charge for the clay, but I ask for donations for my, my physical labor. Yeah, well, that's, that's okay. That's understandable. Well, that's yeah. fine. I look forward to that then, Nancy. Okay, I'll send that over to you, and then you can, you know, you can take a look at that. Sure. And the mono... Yeah, I'll send you something about the monoatomic gold as well. I have a little... Wow, that's fascinating. That's like a real treat now, I feel <laughs> Yeah, I, I really recommend people do both together, because yeah. I do. I put the monoatomic gold in the water with the red clay and the gold, and I mix it all up and drink it. That's how come I knew that you were canceling the show. Because <laughs> you, <were, laughs> you, were, you were on the monoatomic gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, the ancestor postmaster came. Yeah, that's strange because I was like, Nancy knows I'm cancelling the show, and then, <laughs> and, then, and then when you sent me the reply in the email, I was like, that was like you, 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 you were so relaxed, like you knew I was cancelling the show. It's like, oh, yeah, bizarre. <laughs> I knew there was going to be something came, would come well, out. Listen the program, but that's strange. Yeah, yeah. Intuitive knowledge is the only way. It is. It's the only way. It all. It's all out there for us. Sure. That's well, great. You, Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. Nancy, it's been an honor and a pleasure for me. Have you got any books in the pipeline? I should have asked. Have you anything coming up? Um, you know, I'm I I want to get I have the third star ancestors, which is all about the prophecy and the instructions. I'm trying to find a publisher, you know. I haven't had the greatest experience with publishers. Yeah. Personally. Nancy, I self-published and I, I had trouble, you know. I've actually had trouble with other authors trying to poison my work if they don't like it, you know. Well, it's that's the problem, you know. You you know, And then publishing is for publishers, it's not for writers. <laughs> exactly. It's just like the music industry. It's not for the, it's for the big wigs at the top, yeah. It is. I've never gotten a royalty check on any of my books. Never. Gosh. And it's because they advanced me money to do it, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like... Those people need that money. I need the money. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I self-published and it cost me a pretty penny, but I own the book. But like you know, it's it's it. You can't get it distributed. I, can, I mean, I get it on Amazon US and Amazon UK, but that's because what? I self-published with a publisher and I got around a loophole. Yeah, but what are the are people buying it? Yeah, I I actually have the price of the book paid for now, Nancy. Oh, that's good. But like, yeah, so it's the sales have leveled off, but at least I've paid the cost of the book, it's published, and it's all done at the moment. But I now own the book for life, so the sales can be as slow as they want. And I think it's going to be a slow burner too, so, you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I'm really, really concerned about food, and I'm kind of like walked away from these teachings and these prophecies with a bag of seed mm. and realizing that the whole food supply is contaminated and will get more contaminated, that we have to start growing our own food. Mm. And, you know, for me to spend my time trying to write another book or or to mm. make a movie when I don't have good food, mm. you know, my thought is I think I better work on getting on growing. Three years ago, Nancy, I started growing my own food, and you know why? I felt ashamed of myself one day that I was so... I'm a pretty smart guy. I, I've got two degrees and two masters. I don't brag about it, besides the point. Oh, really? <laughs> it's besides the point, but it's like... I, I think that I'm pretty smart in a few areas, and I'm not. I, I know I'm not because I don't know about the biological kingdom. I don't know. I'm I'm like... You know, it's a shame, and it's a, it's a, to myself like I don't know much about how to grow plants. And I went, I'm not going to have this anymore. I'm not, and I'm going to make changes. And I said, well, I started growing everything from seed myself in my own greenhouse with organic. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing at the start. I had to learn how to grow. And, I, and oh, that's fantastic. And I, but you know what? I was just disgusted with myself, Nancy, for not knowing. You know, I, that, I actually really was pissed off. About well, we have to go that way. I mean, we're we're really going to run in. I mean, the hope you're some of their prophecies are downright scary about, you know, and especially right now they're saying, you know, mm. well, I've seen some, some young people come out and say, you know, come come over here and start growing the food. We need to grow this food because mm. food is going to be, it's going to get less and less available, good food. So you really have to grow your own. Yeah, it's the pesticides. It's, I, I used to think, you know, just get off meat and just eat vegetables, and then I, I, I changed that idea because it's like there's as much pesticides and problems with the vegetables than the organic is the way, like, you know, if you, if you can, like. Yeah. But learning how to do it is essential as well, I mean. Oh, there's another, uh, I found out because, wait near this, Nancy, just before I go, there's an organization called Woofing, W-W-O-O-F, that means the Worldwide Organic... Um, organization or uh, organization for organic farming. I think that's it. W W O O F. And basically, you can go away and stay in an organic farm and have free accommodation. This is a European thing, I think. And uh, so one of the other guests told me this, and I'm going to try it. So you can go and stay in an organic farm and learn how to do good organic gar- farming. And all you do is give some hours of work of labor per day, and you get your food and accommodation for, and you'll see another place in Europe, or you get to travel a bit and free accommodation and board and. So if you want to go and learn a bit of organic farming, it's a good way to do it. So, you know, mm-hmm. all the techniques, because there's good little tips and tricks from organic farming and how to make your own compost and all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to do that for a couple of weeks as well. Like, so. Yeah, yeah, we have to go in that direction. Actually, it's going to be a life-saving thing. Sure, sure. I really That's- believe that. Well, on a positive, we leave that on a positive note, Nancy. But uh, yeah. pleasure having to chat to you. It really has. And uh, please stay in touch. I look forward to the extra information you're going to send. Okay, I will. And again, if, any, if anybody wants to contact Nancy, do, nancyredstar.com. Yep. Uh, Nancy Red, well, actually, it's nancyred.star at yahoo.com. Okay. And also, you know, I'm on Facebook under Star Ancestors, or Na- I'm also under Nancy Red Star. And um, sure. people can contact you, and then you can give them my email. Sure. That's probably yeah. the best way. Yeah. yeah, I've got all my information on the page as well. So. Okay. And and then when, once I send you the information, you'll have a better understanding. Standing of it as well. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Well, thank you again, Nancy. Pleasure. Okay, thank you. You take care now. All right. Bye now. Bye.